nuclear weapons are tools of astonishing destructive power. Today, the combined nuclear arsenals of the world's great powers have the capability to end all life on Earth, and the possession of their deterrent power by a nation bestows great geostrategic advantage. Now, the power of a nuclear bomb comes from its ability to deliver incredible destruction with a very small payload, in contrast to conventional weapons. Hence, a single nuclear bomb de delivered by a single bomber aircraft or ballistic missile can inflict the same damage as an entire bomber fleet carrying conventional weapons, uh, and perhaps even more. For example, Little Boy, the bomb that was uh, dropped on Hiroshima, exploded with a force of 15,000 tons of TNT, despite weighing only 4.4 tons. Moreover, only about 64 kilograms of this was the actual uranium material, and above that, only 1.3% or 0.83 kilograms actually underwent nuclear, f uh, nuclear fission and contributed to this explosive power. Hence, less than a kilogram of uranium could deliver the same destructive force as 15,000 tons of TNT. And in fact, this 1.3% is still very inefficient. In just a few years, the technology improved. And uh, in 1952, when the US tested the Ivy King device, uh, roughly the same amount of uranium was used to match 500,000 tons of TNT. Now, Ivy King was the second most powerful fission-only device ever tested. However, the subsequent thermonuclear devices, which combine both fission and fusion, display explosive yields that could be one or two degrees of magnitude greater. So, it's undeniable nuclear weapons pack an incredible punch. But how do they actually work? Well, I thought I'd start off with a bit of history. Uh, so in 1932, the English physicist James Chadwick announces that he's discovered a new subatomic particle called the neutron. Now, the neutron is roughly the same mass as the proton, but what's significant about it is that it's electrically neutral, which means when fired at an atomic nucleus, it can actually slip under the electrostatic uh, field produced by the protons in the nucleus um, and could in some cases be absorbed into the nucleus itself. Whereas it's much harder to do this with, uh, say, a proton or an alpha particle, because these would just be deflected off in most cases. So, in 1934, the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi actually does some of these experiments, uh, firing uh, neutrons at uh, atomic nuclei. And he reports that when he bombarded uranium with neutrons, he was actually able to create new heavier elements, the so-called transuranic elements. Uranium is the heaviest naturally occurring element in the universe, so this was a big deal, and Fermi ended up getting the Nobel Prize in 1938. However, as it turns out, his assumption about the transuranic elements was actually mistaken. So in 1938, uh, December 1938, the chemist uh, Otto Hahn, working at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, Notice that when he bombarded uranium nuclei with neutrons, he was actually getting lighter and not heavier elements as reaction products. Specifically, his chemical analysis confirmed the presence of both uh, barium and, as he later discovered, also krypton, which, is, which are both roughly half the mass of uranium. But this result was really inexplicable with regard to the prevailing physical theories of the day. So he sent his results to the physicist Lisa Meitner to see if she could tell what was going on. Now what had in fact happened was that the process of absorbing the neutron had rendered the uranium nucleus unstable and caused it to break into products such as barium and krypton. But now the puzzle facing Meitner was how this process could happen from the perspective of physics. So uh, she worked on the problem with her nephew, Otto Frisch, who was also a physicist who happened to be working with Niels Bohr at the time. And in the end, Meitner and Frisch arrived at an account that made use of the so-called liquid drop model of the nucleus, which had been proposed by physicist George Gamow in 1929. In this model, a nucleus could be treated like a drop of water held together by some cohesive force between the nuclear particles. Now what happens when a nucleus absorbs a neutron is that it increases the energy level of the nucleus, which causes it to wobble unstably, kind of like a drop of water when it is perturbed. 
Now these perturbations have the potential to form the nucleus into a kind of unstable dumbbell shape in which the two segments are being pushed apart by electrostatic Coulomb forces. And eventually, these repulsive forces can overcome the cohesive forces and the nucleus could break into two. So in the case of uranium, barium and krypton are commonly formed along with three uh, free neutrons. Now Otto Frisch himself has pretty evocatively described this process. Uh, he said the picture is one of the gradual deformation of the original uranium nucleus, its elongation, formation of a waste, and finally separation of the halves. Striking similarity of that process with the process of fission, by which bacteria multiply, uh, of course, caused him to use the phrase nuclear fission. Um, and in fact, he coined this phrase, uh, getting direct inspiration uh, from the process of binary fission, through which many bacteria uh, divide and multiply. Now, this whole process can be thought of in sort of energetic terms. So on the y-axis here, we have nuclear potential energy. And on the x-axis, we have just some kind of catch-all variable that describes the shape and morphology of the nucleus and so on. So a regular uh, unperturbed nucleus lies in a sort of stable trough uh, behind a potential energy barrier. So the absorption of a moving neutron, which has kinetic energy, gives this nucleus an energy boost that enables it to climb up the potential energy gradient and eventually attain the so-called activation energy uh, required to reach an unstable crest, after which it could fall down the other side uh, with the nucleus having undergone fission. Uh, but now what happens to this energy? Well, first of all, the energy is released in the form of the uh, kinetic energy of the uh, reaction products. But very quickly after, like on the order of 10 to the minus 12 seconds, it's converted to gamma rays, which are highly energetic electromagnetic radiation. It is these rays, in fact, that transmit the destructive power of a nuclear bomb, incinerating everything close by and triggering a shock wave that delivers high devastation within a certain radius. Now, uh, every atom that, uh, of uranium-235, say, that undergoes fission releases about 202 uh, mega electron volts of energy, which is about 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11 joules. Now this in itself is very small, but considering how many uranium atoms there are in just a moderately sized sample, uh, just one kilogram of the stuff is able to release 8.3 times 10 to the 13 joules, assuming that it all undergoes fission, of course, um, which is the energy extractable from around 570,000 gallons of crude oil, uh, which is a lot of oil. Right, so now I've talked about energy and stuff, but why does splitting an atom actually release energy in the first place? Uh, well, to explain that, we have to look at how an atomic nucleus is actually held together. So there's two main forces at play here. Uh, first, there's the electrostatic forces between the protons in the nucleus. Now, these are just trying to push every proton uh, away from every other proton because they're of the same charge. They're or positively charged. However, they do not uh, affect the electrically neutral neutrons. Now, the second uh, force is the strong nuclear force. Uh, and this is what actually holds the nucleus together. So as you can see from the top right graph, uh, this force is actually repulsive at very short distances with a positive value for the force. Uh, but then it becomes attractive. And at certain ranges, it completely overpowers the electrostatic force. So this allows the nucleus to hold together. However, the strong nuclear force tapers off very quickly with distance. So in practice, it only binds a nucleon with its immediate neighbors. In contrast to the electrostatic force, though, it affects both protons and neutrons, which is an added advantage. So it's these two forces that determine the stability of atomic nuclei. With small nuclei, the addition of new nucleons actually increases stability because now there are more nucleons which can exert uh, the strong force on each other. However, in bigger nuclei, it's now difficult uh, for nucleons on opposite sides of the nucleus uh, to actually attract each other with the strong force because at those distances, the force is very weak. On the other hand, 
the electrostatic force does not taper as much with distance. The protons throughout the nucleus are all repelling each other. And this dynamic makes it such that adding new nucleons uh, actually decreases stability in larger nuclei. And this trend can be summarized in this graph here, which shows atomic mass, or the number of nucleons on the x-axis, and stability on the y-axis. And here, stability is just represented by the binding energy per nucleon, which is the amount of energy it would take per nucleon to fully break up a nucleus. So the general trend is up uh, and then down, with a few outliers, such as helium here, which has its own reasons for being very stable. Uh, and then at the top of the curve here, we have iron, which is the most stable of all elements. And then as we progress, stability decreases with uranium close to the end here. So as we can see, the graph is divided into two sections, one where nuclear fusion occurs and one where nuclear fission occurs, both in the name of increasing stability. So that's the physics of it. But how can nuclear fission actually be used to create a massive explosion? Well, it really came down to the Hungarian physicist Leo Szilard, who realized in 1933 uh, that if some energy-producing nuclear reaction could actually produce the conditions for its own reoccurrence, then what you'd have is a self-sustaining chain reaction that could yield massive amounts of energy for little input. And of course, uh, in 1933, he did not specifically know about nuclear fission because it had not been discovered yet, uh, but as it turns out, it fit the bill. So, the neutrons emitted from uranium fission could then proceed to knock into other uranium atoms and so on, and this process could continue in an iterative manner. However, there were still two obstacles that could impede the use of a nuclear chain reaction in some sort of bomb. And the first is the issue of purity. So the isotope uranium-235, which has 92 protons and 143 pro, uh, neutrons, uh, is what we call fissile, which means it can undergo fission when hit with a low energy neutron, the so-called thermal neutron. On the other hand, uranium-238, which has uh, 92 protons and 146 neutrons, is fissionable, but not fissile, which means it can undergo fission only when hit with a fast-moving, highly energetic neutron. And this is just because the activation energy for uranium-238 is higher. Now, fissionable isotopes like U-238 cannot sustain chain reactions. So in order for any uranium-based nuclear weapon to work, it must contain a sufficiently pure sample of uranium-235. The problem is that in nature, the uranium found uh, in uranium ore is typically only 0.7% pure. So only 0.7% of it is uranium-235. Now to work in a power generating nuclear reactor, the sample needs to be about 3 to 5% pure. But to work in a nuclear bomb, it needs to be about 90% pure. Now, fortunately for budding nuclear weapon makers, uh, a set of techniques exist for uranium purification. One of the most popular is the gas centrifuge. Now the idea is that some uranium compound is vaporized, then fed into the centrifuge which spins and kind of moves the gas around, and centripetal forces will push the gas outwards. But what's important here is that uranium-238 will be pushed out even more due to its higher mass. So this technique can be used to separate out the uranium-235 that's needed. Now the process of purifying uranium is called uranium enrichment, and its role in producing weapons-grade uranium um, makes it uh, highly relevant usually to geopolitics. So for example, uh, in the Iran nuclear deal agreed in 2015, there are a number of clauses that uh, directly pertain to the degree of enrichment that Iran would be allowed uh, to carry out. But in any case, even with highly pure samples, there remains one other obstacle, and that's the issue of critical mass. Now, when a neutron is emitted from a fission reaction, it's not certain that it'll actually bump into another nucleus. 
uh, if on average every reaction causes one other reaction, then we've reached what we can call critical density or critical mass. Now, if this magnification factor is less than one, then the chain reaction fizzles out. However, at supercritical mass, the reaction is able to expand exponentially, and a significant amount of the sample will undergo fission. So, for a nuclear weapon, ideally, that's what we would want. Uh, and now, it's important here to remember that even though a sample of uranium might look dense, actually the nuclei uh, tend to occupy a very, very small space of this because they're very sp uh, far spaced out um, relative to the size of each nucleus. So it's actually not certain in many cases that uh, a flying neutron will actually bump into a nucleus unless supercritical mass is attained. Uh, but from the issue of nuclear weapons design, ideally, uh, what we'd want is for our sample to be subcritical for pretty much all of the time, except for when the device is meant to go off, upon which we'd want it to become supercritical. This is because due to the presence of spontaneous fission events, a supercritical sample will generally just undergo a chain reaction spontaneously. Uh, so a crucial component of the design of a nuclear bomb is getting the sample to reach supercriticality at just the right moment. Uh, now, at the outset, two main ways of doing this were conceived. The first is the gun type assembly method, which was used uh, for Little Boy, but does not actually feature in any nuclear weapons today for various reasons that I'll mention. Uh, so, this method basically just works by taking two subcritical samples, which is the bullet and the target and then using a conventional explosive to push the two samples together until they reach supercriticality. Now, an alternative method is the implosion type device, where a series of explosives is used to compress a core, which is made of uranium or plutonium, which then pushes the core into supercriticality, at which time the cavity is flooded with neutrons to expedite a chain reaction. Now, the implosion scheme was developed at around the same time as the gun type scheme, and it was in fact used in, in Fat Man, which was dropped on Nagasaki. However, it quickly became dominant over the gun type scheme, which was soon abandoned by the United States, uh, and actually never used by other nuclear powers such as Great Britain or the Soviet Union. And this is because the gun scheme suffers from several drawbacks that are not encountered by implosion weapons. First of all, the enrichment level of uranium required in gun-type devices is stringently high compared to that required in implosion devices. And this is because gun-type devices don't compress the uranium to higher densities. They just assemble two separate samples so that they become one supercritical sample. This additionally also rules out the use of plutonium in gun-type devices, since it's difficult to purify plutonium to the required levels. And moreover, it presents a considerable safety hazard since, well, if somehow by accident the two samples were to come together, then uh, kaboom. Uh, but on the other hand, in implosion devices, this kind of accident is far less likely given that the explosives have to detonate simultaneously to get the core to the required density. And in addition to safety, uh, plutonium can also be used in implosion devices, and it was in fact plutonium that was used in Fat Man. So, that's a very quick walk through the physics uh, and the, some of the history behind nuclear weapons, the most astonishing and destructive weapons of our time. There are so many aspects that I haven't covered here, such as how ballistic missiles work, or even anything about thermonuclear weapons, which are far more powerful than just fission weapons but I might leave that to another video. For now, thanks for watching.